And I wanted to welcome uh, everybody to the 15th webinar of 2014 hey. for the California. Excuse me. Sorry. Okay, so I wanted to welcome everybody to the 15th webinar of 2014 entitled Neon Museum, a Mid-Century Case Study. Uh, we encourage you to become a member of CPF and enjoy the educational discounts and benefits. Information on membership can be found on our website at californiapreservation.org. The California Preservation Foundation is a membership-based, not-for-profit organization whose mission is to provide statewide leadership in education and advocacy to ensure protection of historic resources in California. The format for today's webinar will consist of six speakers presenting for a total of 60 to 75 minutes. We will close with a 10 to 15 minute question and answer period. And for your information, there is a Q&A box on the bottom left hand side of your screen. If you'd like to ask a question at any time during the presentation, you would simply type in your question in the box and we will hold the question until it can be addressed by a speaker. Uh, you should also note that there's a comment box right above the Q&A box, which is visible to all participants. If you would like to comment or interject, you may do so through the chat box. If you are attached to a microphone, you should grant Adobe Connect voice access. Uh, you can do so, uh, but your voice will be muted for most of the presentation. Uh, you may raise your hand by clicking on the hand symbol at the top of your screen. Once your hand is raised, we will grant you voice access at an appropriate time in the presentation. This will allow you to have a short dialogue with the speakers or ask a question in person. If for some reason your sound does not work, you will need to type in your question or response in the chat box. I'm now going to turn uh, it over to our moderator for today, Robert Chattel of Chattel Architecture Planning and Preservation. Uh, but before I do so, I'm going to need to mute everybody in the room for a brief second. So hold on one second here. All right, uh, Robert, you are ready to begin. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, uh, this is what we expect will be a fun and wild ride today. The Neon Museum webinar grew out of a talk I gave at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago entitled The Atomic Wild Wild West. And it's one of the more creative projects I showed in that presentation, which is why the California Preservation Foundation chose to highlight it in the series on modern architecture. Um, of, course, of course, it's a project fraught with seemingly insurmountable challenges, but blessed with committed folks, uh, a great building, and a vision for the future. Um, for those of you who cannot read uh, the Sunset Magazine caption, and this is an image of the uh, Neon Museum uh, Visitor Center, um, it is, quote, in a city obsessed with tearing down and building anew, it's surprising to see Las Vegas embracing what's left of its past. This project represents a coming of age of sorts, a, a time over the last decade or so when Las Vegas turned inward to explore and celebrate what is true and real, <clears throat> yes, real, its own history. Um, some might be supposed to learn about or, or even that that there is, in fact, there, there, a, a rich architectural and cultural history in Las Vegas. But suffice to say, Las Vegas is a certified local government under federal law, has an engaged and active preservation constituency, a committed historic preservation commission, supported by caring and capable staff in the planning, public work, cultural affairs, economic development, and other departments, along with support create and visionary leaders in the city manager, council, and mayor. Um, those of you who are intimately familiar, um, we're now at the second round of Goodman's um, with Carolyn Goodman as mayor. Um, uh, how fitting is it to present this webinar free to members of nonprofit organizations in three, sta three western states, so 
welcome all. Um, it's truly a special case study, as I said, a saga with a happy ending involving an iconic mid 20th century building designed by master architect Paul Revere Williams, the first African American member of the American Institute of Architects and the first African American fellow of that organization. Um, the building, of course, relocated, as you'll see from the world famous Las Vegas Strip, um, which few people know is outside the city of Las Vegas in unincorporated Clark County, Nevada, to an area just north of downtown in the city of Las Vegas proper, and reused as the Neon Museum and National Scenic Byway Visitor Center. Um, some notes about organization and brief introduction uh, of our speakers today. I'll serve as moderator. I'm a Los Angeles-based preservation architect who has contributed to the project over many years. Following me, Nancy Diener, um, the director of cultural affairs for the city of Las Vegas, who introduced me to the Neon Museum and the La Concha in 2004 when we were we're working on the early stages of the museum. Um, Nancy will talk briefly about the early days of the Neon Museum and the La Concha, as we like to say, opportunity um, to serve as a public face, um, building a sign, if you will, the Neon Museum and their boneyard of unrestored once in service signs from the Strip and elsewhere in the Valley. Um, Nancy will be followed by Torrance, California-based structural engineer Mel Green, whose extensive experience in historic preservation has touched numerous projects throughout the West, particularly in the state of Nevada. Um, my associate historic preservation planner, planner Shane Swordlow served as our project manager for the final phase of the project. Architectural historian Mara Jones, the Nevada State Historic Preservation Office in Carson City will discuss the project review process with the Commission for Cultural Affairs State Grant Funding Program and under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. And finally, Danielle Kelly, the very capable executive director and CEO of the Neon Museum, will give insights into the collection, visitor experience, and success of the La Concha and Boneyard. So just a, a brief introduction. Um, there are three images up, um, and on the left is a historic view of the La Concha Motel on the Strip in the 1960s. To the north is the Riviera Hotel, the first so-called high-rise constructed on the Strip in 1955. In its original location, the La Concha, constructed in 1961, exhibits the key elements of a Strip motel, as stated in Learning from Las Vegas a typical complex containing a building that is near enough to the highway to be seen from the road across the parked cars, yet far enough back to accommodate driveways, turnarounds, and parking. Regardless of the front, the back of the building is stylless. In this instance, the pylon sign announces the, the motel to drivers from some distance, and the expressive thin shell concrete lobby serves as a sign to draw them in. Of course, um, as the saga goes, uh, the building deteriorates. The motel struggles to keep up with the latest and greatest themed resort casino. The pylon portion of the sign is removed. The motel wing is demolished. And ultimately, the lobby itself, um, through a feat of structural gymnastics, comes apart in pieces to be stitched back together on a new site, still on Las Vegas Boulevard, but now a few miles to the north outside the ring of freeways, the spaghetti bowl, as it's known locally, that defines what's inside and outside in this rich and varied wonderland. And now our story begins. Nancy? Okay, let me enable Nancy's sound here one second. Nancy, you're ready to Testing. go. Testing. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Um, it's, it's a privilege to be here today and be part of this webinar. I have, there's a lot to cover. I'm going to try to be brief. So if I compartmentalize and condense a lot, there's a lot. Each one of these things could be its own webinar, practically. Um, my involvement with the Neon Museum started actually in the 80s before I even worked for the city. And uh, I was one of many people in the 80s who were dedicated towards saving neon signs. There were many initiatives. People in the community were very aware um, of the fact that these signs were being demolished, taken apart, and we were losing them to collectors. 
So fast forward, uh, people like Liz Warren in 1978 worked with our then mayor Bill Breer in putting together a historic preservation study of all kinds of things, including signs and buildings. Um, she was the then president of the Southern Nevada Historical Society. So many people came together, but it was just too hard to save them because of their scale in reality. And a quick story, um, I sat on a little committee that was chaired by um, T.J. Schumann, who was a local architect, and we wound up getting a grant from the Nevada Arts Council to restore the Hacienda Horse and Rider. I think it was 25000 We restored it, and we had absolutely no place to put it, and it was huge, and we were going to put it in this location, and when they found out how tall it was, so the logistics of this project began to really sink into all of us that it was a lot more than objects or paintings. These were very huge things that we had to deal with. So fast forward to the 90s, early 90s, 1990, 91, uh, then Mayor Jan Jones came in and um, she was interested in, people had come and talked to her and she was interested in the idea of a neon museum and her uh, liaison was Barbara Malasky and Barbara and I talked and we were all very aware of the impact and the necessity of saving these signs so we all started working together. The city started to throw its its um, power, if you will, toward reclaiming and getting these signs. And it really, really took the city's efforts to do this. It could not, I, I'm absolutely convinced it could not have happened on its own. And luckily the city was very committed to it. Mayor Jones was totally committed to it, then Mayor Oscar Goodman, and currently Mayor Carolyn Goodman. All the mayors have been very supportive of this project. So anyway, in the 90s, various groups, ultimately city stepped in. And city staff started working out. We had staff people assigned to it. We called them urban detectives because they started going around trying to find signs that we heard were in danger or that were going to come down or be imploded. I mean, we were really kind of stealth-like. Um, and it wasn't easy in those days. Sometimes we would just miss a sign that a collector was driving away with. And some of these signs, as you know, are, were irreplaceable. So in November 13th, 1996, and I am hoping, yes, there it is. Um, this is a picture of the Hacienda Horse and Rider. It's dismantled. It came from a hotel called the Hacienda, which I believe is now where the Mandalay Bay stands. Um, the people who used to work at this hotel when they first heard the Neon Museum got this sign called me and said, oh, no, 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 that's a caballero on a palomino. That's the name of that sign. So for a while, I tried to insert that title in it, but it just didn't work. Everybody still <laughs> calls it Hacienda Horse and Rider. So, okay, where do we put this sign? So um, we wound up putting it on the corner of Fremont Street and Las Vegas Boulevard, and actually was the first sign in the scenic byways. And here's a picture of it installed, and you can go downtown today and see this sign. It's a pretty amazing sign. Um, all right, so now I'm going to kind of scoot on. Here's we, we wound up getting these signs, refurbishing them, and not having any place to put them. That was the big problem. So we started putting them downtown. We called them galleries. This was the Third Street Gallery. This is a red barn sign, which is one of our, our most exquisite signs. It was installed down there. Um, we put a bunch of signs down on Fremont Street. I think we had about nine signs down on Fremont Street. But it was quickly becoming apparent that we could not continue. I mean, we're, we're, we were getting more signs. As more and more people knew there was a place that the signs could go and be protected, we were getting more and more signs. And we were running out of space. So the then the assistant city manager Steve Houchin said to me one day, "Well, you know, we have some vacant land on Las Vegas Boulevard. Maybe we can store them there." I said, "Great, it's a deal," and that's actually in the current location of the Neon Museum. So we started. Here's kind of a slide of the Aladdin's lamp from the Aladdin Hotel on the Strip, and that's what the boneyard first looked like. It was a big, empty, vacant space. We even installed a security camera that took pictures of it, and it just looked like lunar a lunar landscape. Um, so that's what it looked like for a long time. Here are more signs. You can see the tumbleweed growing up. Um, that's the R from the Sahara sign. We just we just saved them. We just put them in there. Here we started to kind of put them around because people then wanted to see them. A lot of people wanted to see them. Um, we kept here's here's the um, horseshoe casino sign being installed into the boneyard into the collection. That sign is now on the scenic byway, which is on Las Vegas Boulevard that Robert talked about a minute ago. 
So um, we decided, we, the city people said, you know, we need to get a committee going. We need to formalize it. So the formal initiative of a 501c3 Neon Museum with a board of directors, bylaws, etc., was launched with the city as its sole member. We had to figure out how to make it so it was a 501c3, but the city was still intimately involved in it and how it all meshed and worked together. And this was, with the thanks to the city attorney, Terry Poncello, this was the method we came up with. The city became its sole member, and that worked. And that happened October 1st, 1997. We received our 501c3 designation in January 1999. It took a while. In 2000, I'm going to skip forward here. There's the silver slipper, as you can see. And uh, here's the silver slipper uh, refurbished and installed also on the scenic byway right outside in front of the Neon Museum. Oh, we didn't want to go there yet. OK, so in 2000, a 25-year lease is signed for 0.66 acres on Las Vegas Boulevard as a place to take in signs, including the Yesco Boneyard signs. In 2001, the city folds the 0.66 acres in with the larger parcel across the street on McWilliams, and it gave the museum and gave the museum a 50-year lease for both parcels. And then the Yesco signs moved over, which was the bulk of our collection. In 2002, the Neon Museum and the city agree to an amicable we called it an amicable divorce. The board of directors went to the city and I kind of wore all hats because I was on the board. I, I was on the board for many years, but I worked for the city and still work for the city. So I would see it on all sides. The board felt they couldn't fundraise. They're a nonprofit. Who's going to give money to the city? They just couldn't fundraise. They needed the divorce. So the board had its its own attorneys, the city attorneys, they worked out this amicable divorce and ultimately the city said fine. You know, you're going to continue the mission. We're going to expect this, this, and this from you. Um, and we will retain three appointments on your board, which they had for a long, long time. They no longer have those. They actually relinquished that right last year, knowing that the museum is doing so well now. I mean, it's kind of like this is a wonderful project, and we totally trust you guys. So they no longer have the appointments on the board, but the city does retain ownership. They own the land, and if the museum were ever unravel the city would step in and own all of its um, all of its signs its building and everything that it had um, in 2004 now I'm going to fast forward to that next slide 2004 the board of directors goes to the Las Vegas Convention Visitors Authority for three hundred thousand dollars to on the off chance that we can move this La Concha as the visitor center for the Neon Museum. Everybody had been talking about it, that the wrecking ball was coming, we couldn't lose another building, wouldn't it be perfect for this project? So we went to the LVCVA, we asked them for 300,000, which they agreed if we matched it with 300,000. 600,000, we thought we had died and gone to heaven. Yes, we can do that. And, and we did match it. We, $600,000 we thought was more money than we needed. Turns out it wasn't. <laughs> But it did enable the building to, we, we went to the then owners of the building, we said, it's a go, we've got to just figure out how to move it down. I started calling companies that moved buildings, and what I quickly learned was that the building was way too tall, the wingspans were too tall to fit under our freeways. Well, then we could drive it all the way around, I guess, to Utah and all the way back and avoid freeways, but it became prohibitively expensive. So then I checked on the train. OK, well, there's a train that goes right through the middle of town. We could put it on a train. It could just go right downtown. But it was too <laughs> wide for the train tracks and all of that. So then somebody said, oh, Nancy, you know, they helicopter buildings. Oh, great. So I checked into all of the companies that do that. And it was too heavy to helicopter. There was just one helicopter that could take that weight, and it was the Chinooks. And I'm thinking, well, they're really busy right now fighting a war. I don't think they're going to want to come back here and do that. So I didn't pursue that any further. However, at that time, and this is key to us getting the La Concha, the National Trust for Historic Preservation awarded the Neon Museum a $4,000 intervention fund grant, which provided funding to pay for a structural engineer, which was Mel Green, to assess the structure and see how it could be moved. And Anthea Hurtig, director of the Western Office, affirmed the trust support for preserving the La Concha. That was key.
Now, I'm going to wrap my thing up. I will just sum up by saying this thing. Most of the money that went into the Nyan Museum, the building, the signs, all of it came from grants. And I'm going to say that the grants came from the Nevada Commission for Cultural Affairs, almost one and a half million dollars. The Las Vegas Centennial Commission, one million three hundred and thirty thousand dollars. The Las Vegas Convention of Visitors Authority, the Nevada State Legislature, the Federal Scenic Byways, Kaiser Foundation, Caesars Foundation, and Snippelma, which is the Southern Nevada uh, Plans, uh, Southern Nevada Lands Management Act. I always get that one wrong, which was key. That was four and a half million dollars to develop that site and the little neon boneyard park. So most of the money that came for this project didn't come from the private sector. It really, the majority of it came from grants um, that were key. We wouldn't have been able to do it without those grants. So, um, and timing. Timing is everything. We were in there in the right place at the right time. We had had this project moved so far along that by the time the recession came, which hurt a lot of projects in Southern Nevada, it was so far along, it was no turning back. I don't know what would have happened had, had that happened earlier in the game. You know, I'm really not sure we would have been able to have gotten the La Concha. But it, timing is everything. Timing and hard work and everybody that's been involved with this project, all the mayors I talked about, Barbara Molaski, Dorothy and Frank Wright, everybody, preservationists in this community, have been key to its success. And with that, I am I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you, Nancy. So that. Um, thank you, Nancy. Said, would you look um, what we thought uh, the Lacan? So let's move on. Um, Mel, you're up next. Um, please tell us what your study found and, and how you approach the project.
Great, thank you, Mel. Um, fascinating how that was done, and I I had not heard Mel talk about it, so it was really great to to see and hear. Um, uh, Shane Swordlow is next, who was the project manager in the the uh, I guess you could call the second and last phase of the um, uh, rehabilitation. Shane, thank you, Robert. Can you hear me? All right. Well. I'll Sorry. Okay, you can hear me. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be discussing the building itself and the phase of the project that involved rehabilitation of the historic La Concha Motel lobby and design of a compatible new addition in conformance with the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. Um, so just to recap quickly what we've already established, uh, we have a historic 1961 lobby that was designed by prolific architect Paul Revere Williams in what's called the Googie style. It was really the building as sign. We have this iconic three par parabolic arches that look like a conch shell. The motel itself uh, was housed in the lobby and a motel wing that was two stories that extended from the rear elevation of the shell and it was located just south of the Riviera Hotel on the Las Vegas Strip. The motel closed in 2002 um, and subsequently the motel wing was demolished, but the La Concha shell, the lobby shell, remains in place. It was threatened with demolition, was saved from demo in 2005, carefully disassembled and relocated to its current site in 2006, reassembled in 2007, and then went through the project of rehabilitation and expansion to reopen.
any adherence. And so consistent with Section 106 requirements, we identified and evaluated whether or not there were any historical pro or historic properties within the boundary, uh, which could be defined as buildings that are either listed in or eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. And in conclusion, our finding was that the only property eligible for listing in the National Register was the La Concha Motel lobby itself. Uh, despite the fact that it had been relocated and that it had lost its motel wing, uh, which was a little utilitarian in character compared to the very iconic concrete shell, um, property with sufficient integrity to be eligible for National Register listing. The other component then of Section 106 review was to assess potential effects on identified historical properties. And our finding was that there would be no adverse effect on the historic property, the La Concha lobby itself. Uh, and that involved um, intimate um, involvement in design development, which I will discuss next. So a very important theme of this project is the importance of research and historic documentation and understanding what a property looked like historically. And we had a variety of sources and really a great selection of historic documentation to draw from in, term, in guiding our development of a design for rehabilitation of the shell and a compatible addition. One of the most helpful photos we had is what you see at the top, this high resolution black and white photo from the Nevada State Museum taken shortly after the La Concha opened in 1961. We can see its location on Las Vegas Boulevard on the Strip. We can see its original sign, um, the lobby itself and the motel wing extending behind it. Uh, but there was a variety of drawings, photographs, ephemera. We can see a great rendering in the lower portion of the slide, which helped to establish some of the colors that were prominent, what the landscape looked like, and what individual details of the property appeared. Um, some additional very helpful photos we had most looked at the La Concha lobby from the front, but were those that looked at it from its rear elevation and how it attached to the two-story motel wing, which really guided decisions, which I'll talk about on the upcoming slides, of how the addition connects with the So as I talk about design development, I'm going to be showing a variety of historic photos that inspired design contemporary photos that show the building today, and renderings that were prepared by project architect Westar Design Group. And you can see in this range of photos um, that there is the lobby itself with the addition extending behind it. Um, and I'll talk about each component of the addition in more detail. So to start broadly at looking at the site itself, um, historic photos really showed us a great overview of what the landscape and hardscape features were of the shell at its original site on the strip. And those inspired a contemporary landscape scheme that interprets the original with Italian cypress trees um, and foundation plantings that are in an area defined by the drip edge of the parabolic roof. So you can see kind of a white um, stone area just near the building that contains the foundation plantings. And in terms of treatment of the historic lobby itself, um, the um, glass and the break metal all reference the original design of the glazing, which is new. In looking at how the lobby relates to and interacts with its new addition, we really carefully studied the documentation that was available of how the lobby related to its original motel wing. And our approach was to create a hyphen element, which you can see is very open. It's all glass, a two-story, roughly in height in its appearance. And it creates this kind of neutral zone that provides a transition from the historic lobby to the addition behind. A really important concept that we studied was circulation and what historic circulation patterns um, existed at the original motel. And Historically, somebody would enter into the interior space of the lobby, and then they'd have to exit outside through two sets of doors at either end of the rear elevation of the lobby in order to enter their guest room. And this circulation pattern served as inspiration for how one approaches the Neon Museum in any spaces that are housed in the addition, which would include support spaces, administrative spaces, and restrooms. So today, somebody would enter through the lobby, exit doors at either side, and then enter the bone yard or proceed back inside the addition to access a space in there. 
Um, here I have some additional photos that show a historic photo on the left of the uh, emotional material for the La Concha Motel, which shows nice details of what existed on the motel wing that's no longer extant and this aqua hue that was present throughout the property. And again, all of this served as inspiration for what we see in the addition, including the scoring of concrete and the hardscape. Um, you can see the aqua hue throughout the addition, including a wall that's clad in blue tile. There was historically a blue tile wall just near the swimming pool. Um, fenestration and windows in the addition reference the size, design, configuration of the sliding glass doors that were located in the motel wing. And of course, there are horizontal elements that project over windows at the addition. Uh, we call them eyebrows, but they really are inspired by the pattern of, of uh, balconies that extended from the motel wing. In looking at the interior, we had some great postcards and photos, and uh, Mel showed some of those that showed what the interior of the lobby looked like. And um, very little was left from the interior, um, so we used historic photos to inspire our contemporary designs for new features and fixtures located within the lobby. The sign that you see on the back wall, that present sign, is original. The reception desk is new. Um, that had changed and evolved over the years, uh, but the new desk does very closely reference the style of the original. And uh, we used historic photos of light fixtures to guide the design of custom, custom designed new pendant fixtures hanging from the ceiling. So we've talked a lot about new features that were inspired by the old, but I just want to close with um, some great photos that we have of um, historic elements that were restored and are now present at the NIA Museum. Those include the plastic resin sign, which we can see up close in this photo, and then the um, neon sign that was historically located at the front of the property at its original site that's been restored and is now operational in the boneyard. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shane. Um, uh, next up is Mara Jones, uh, architectural historian with the Nevada State Office of Historic Preservation. And um, Mara worked uh, closely with several grant programs uh, projects. She'll talk about the programs um, and her review of this particular project. Mara. Hi, Robert, and thank you. I appreciate the, uh, being here today. It's truly a pleasure. And as I'm watching the slides, which I'm sure you'll see more of the same here too, I'm struck by how quickly it goes in a presentation and how slowly it went at times when we were actually doing the work. So I wanted to talk about the role a little bit of the State Historic Preservation, or SHPO. It assumed several roles during the rehabilitation of the La Concha, including grant funds and administration as provided by the Commission for Cultural Affairs, as Nancy mentioned. Uh, technical assistance in interpreting the standards, uh, Secretary of the Interior standards, and assisting federal agencies with their compliance responsibilities per federal law, most notably, as you've mentioned, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, or NHPA. The build, our subject building and its transformation into the iconic visitor center of the Neon Museum was funded in part by the State of Nevada's Commission for Cultural Affairs, and Nancy highlighted how uh, uh, how successful they were on grant soliciting and um, the commission was uh, granted a good portion of it and I think supported the timing that she mentioned. As she mentioned, over a total of a million and a half dollars was awarded and spent over a five-year period. This grant program, which was begun in the 1990s in response to the continued loss of Nevada's important architectural resources, had an annual budget of $3 million generated by the state through sale of bonds. And um, in 1910, that annual amount was reduced to economic conditions, again, supporting Nancy about timing is everything. The mission of the CCA is to, risk, to rehabilitate at-risk historic buildings for modern use as cultural centers, usually by nonprofits or municipalities. Uh, let's see. Jonathan said this will work. Thank you. Um, projects have been completed all over Nevada and include such diverse properties as the 1876 Fourth Ward School in Virginia City, part of the Comstock Historic 
Mining District or the National Historic and L National Historic Landmark. It also included the 1967 Pioneer Theater in downtown Reno. Ne Nevada is a state of contrasts. Um, this map shows where all the projects, many of them are, and as you can see, they are all over Nevada. We're a state of contrasts, hot days and cold nights, tall mountains joined by deep valleys, incredible bodies of water and amazing light. It's the seventh largest state in the union with a total population of just over 3 million people, about the same size as the urban boundary of Silicon Valley in California. We, Nevada, do rural and distance well. It has been the goal of the CCA program to support both rural and urban communities and their preservation advocates throughout the state. The total top population of our two largest cities, Reno and Las Vegas, which are almost nine hours apart by car, comprise two of the three million people in Nevada. In addition, over 85% of our land is federally owned and managed, leaving a scant 15% of private lands to meet a large part of the dynamic and urgent demands of our mining, gambling, tourism, and energy uh, industries. So we sometimes have to move historic properties to save them, or we lose them. So gone is the Sands Casino, haunt of the Rat Pack and home of the Copa Club and the ever so sophisticated Antonio, classically trained Antonio Morelli, band leader at the, at the Sands. However, when Mel Morelli's house was in danger due to, and due to be demolished from its um, spot in the Desert Inn Country Club, the CCA and Las Vegas Junior League were able to move Morelli's mid-century modern house to a new site in Las Vegas, and it is now a gathering place for cultural events and is listed on the National Register and Historic Places in part because of the requirements of the CCA grant program which included that all work on any project must be done in compliance with the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties. You've seen this rendering before, and that brings us to the La Concha. It was August 2006 when the La Concha project and I were first introduced, me, the newly hired program manager of the CCA grant program, and the remnant Las La Concha Motel Lobby, with its attached condo sales tent, and the so-called Boneyard, which was housed a collection of neon signs somewhere in Las Vegas, and a vacant lot, all seemingly shards of a past gone by. In December of 2006, armed with money from the CCA and the vision, work, and experience of zillions of people, the lobby was moved. Yup, a relatively small lobby of a missing motel that was then in pieces on the ground was to get a new addition more than twice its size in a new location and the project needed to retain the lobby's integrity and comply with the standards. Game on. There are four <laughs> treatments for historic properties. Preservation, restoration, rehabilitation, reconstruction. For the La Concha we used all four. To those unfamiliar with the SOIS or standards as they are called, they can sometimes be confusing, frustrating, or seemingly ambiguous. But they are brilliant, if used, because they make us preservationists stop, look, and listen. Listen to the history of the building, the constraints of a site, and a proposed new use. Look for character-defining features and connections, and stop to evaluate whether our actions truly reflect what the building needs rather than what we want the building to be. So let's take a few minutes to talk about, and Shane did a wonderful job about this, um, talk about the lobby to tell its uh, story and truly be a physical record of its time. It's not enough to just save something. Most, mostly it, referen it needed reference, balance, and connection to what was missing. And the project needed to fit on a lot that was growing increasingly difficult to use. Just as the design work began, it was discovered to have a utility easement mid-lot that required permanent access with an almost 30-foot vertical clearance. 
By Las Vegas standards, even in the 1960s, the La Concha Motel was a modest project completed in an era when the owners and clients could often be found working on the construction of sites of their own projects. Designed by Paul Rivera Williams, it was eye-catching entrance at the front. When what developed was a complex and an intriguing La Concha shell with a simple yet innovative motel attached to the rear as a counterbalance to the exuberant design. The ex exterior balconies and visual physical connections to the landscape, pool, and patios were a new to interpretation of motel design. Spaces flowed and beckoned, and color was used to evoke a fun tropical paradise and unify the user's experience. Here we can see, as Shane has mentioned, the turquoise of the pool, aqua. I'm not sure they used aqua way back when, but um, the blue tile wall that glimmered in the sun and the patios for re relaxing. Even the mirrors maintained the drip lines of the con La Concha shell, which is interesting that we both find that so intriguing that um, that was a character defining feature of the building. We've seen this slide before. It was important to capture the openness and the feeling of the original uh, building. And this, uh, in the research phase, this photo was one of the first ways that we started seeing the interaction and the connections that have been mentioned earlier between uh, the motel and the, um, what we thought was almost inexplicable. Uh, thanks to Mel, we understand it now. Um, they also used light to direct visitors and, as mentioned, the flow. Here's a close-up of that same photo that does describe the connections. And, um, and here is a view, a close-up of that final connection. Uh, Shane, congratulations for reversing your slide or taking it on the other side. So it matches, but uh, it's very ingenious because it actually, uh, uh, Pat Clink and the Westar team did a fabulous job of really showing uh, all of us how it is connected and how it related to the historic buildings. So, um, and then we have the finished view, which shows the multiple and series pieces and, um, and this wonderful uh, easement for utilities. And I said, um, now I do, um, Robert mentioned, uh, and uh, Nancy mentioned, the grants and the need for Section 106 uh, compliance. And at the time, I was not the Section 106 reviewer, but worked closely with them. Now that I am um, work as the architectural reviewer for the SHPO staff for Section 106 projects in Nevada, I have come to realize how important the use of the standards are for the protection of historic properties. And that was a developing um, issue and, uh, that we all had during this project. CCA grants are state, not federal funds, so the state use Standards use is not mandatory by federal law, but because the standards were used throughout the La Concha project, the Neon Museum Board and the city were able later, when they ran out of money, thank you, Nancy, for not <laughs> mentioning that 600,000 didn't do it, they were able to solicit additional federal monies through the Scenic Byways Program, through other grants that have already been mentioned, and seamlessly, with the help of chattel architecture, comply with the Section 106 process of the National Historic Preservation Act. It's that's an important point that I wanted to make today because um, so often projects will start with one intention and use different rules that then have to change in the mid-project, which is extremely time consuming for an organization and very difficult for us as reviewers to um, inform someone that they have not conformed to uh, federal requirements. So um, it's been a privilege to be involved uh, with everyone who made the vision of the Neon Museum come true. And um, thanks, Robert, for this gig. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Mara. That was wonderful. Um, uh, let's move on now to Danielle Kelly, who's the executive director and CEO of the Neon Museum. And she'll tell us uh, a bit more about um, her involvement and um, what it's like to be a, a visitor there. Danielle. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of uh, briefly talk about um, 
the visitor experience, why we made the decisions that we made um, in shaping the type of experience the visitor will have, um, and uh, kind of talk, talk you through some of those decisions. Um, you know, first I think what, what I would just like to mention is that I joined the project in 2008. Uh, at that time, there was um, about midway through 2008, at that time the shell had just been put back together. Um, so we had a dirt lot with a beautiful clamshell on it and three acres of unrestored signs divided into two yards uh, directly behind it. We were giving um, tours. The, literally the week I started, we started giving tours twice a day on a regular basis for people who signed up. And we gave tours five times a day, five times a week. Um, but there was a pre-existing, very robust film and photo shoot department. Now, I think it's really important to point out that so much of the grant monies and so much of the energy was going into building out this facility. Um, and so it was the wonderful generosity of people that came on our tours, looked for us in the middle of nowhere in downtown Las Vegas to help support the nonprofit. Um, so what you see here is this was a, this is fiscal year 12. So this is immediately before we opened the visitor center in October of 2012. That year our attendance was 20,927 visitors. On tours we had 18,602 visitors. On photo shoots we had 2,325 visitors. Now, when I started in 2008, there were months where there were 75 people who came in the month, and there were the maximum number that came in any one month at that point was around 700 people. So over that period of time, that was an extreme word of mouth growth in, in visitorship. So this is prior to the visitor center opening. This is zero promotional budget. This is four staff people, and a wonderful list of volunteers that were incredibly devoted and passionate. Um, and these visitors coming because they heard about it from their friends. And there you see the shell and the boneyard. Um, now when, uh, when planning for opening visitor center, and it was really a privilege to be able to work on planning for this visitor center and I got to work closely with most people on this panel in doing so. So it, it, was, it was truly a, an honor and a privilege to be a part of. Um, when planning, there was really nothing like the Mia Museum. There were no examples to use as a guide for how to achieve our goals alongside the unique necessities of this collection of signs. Um, we pulled from multiple sources for inspiration and examples. So obviously historic homes, you have an, ex an historic structure, but there wasn't a lot of it left and it's a motel. People visit historic homes, but they don't necessarily, uh, there were no examples out there of historic motels that were no longer functioning that people visited. Um, we looked at sculpture parks, we looked at botanic gardens. Additionally, we looked at art and design museums that we loved, um, the staff, the board, et cetera. Um, our original plan was to open for general admission in a self-guided capacity. So we would open the doors daily, people would walk through the boneyard, um, and these are images of the boneyard at the time. They would guide themselves through. Um, however, uh, after much deliberation, staff discussions, constant staff discussion, uh, informal surveys with visitors, docents, and volunteers, we decided to retain the guided tour experience because uh, of a number of reasons. First, the safety of the signs and visitor crowd control. Um, you know, the signs, although they, they are, uh, the economy of scale is incredible, they're massive, they're, they do involve metal, um, they're also actually quite fragile. The silver slipper, for example, is um, hand-built fiberglass. It's very sensitive to touch. Um, if anyone touched it or leaned on it, they could have caved into the sign. Um, so the signs themselves are actually quite vulnerable, but also obviously can be dangerous. And adults that are around objects bigger than them they get very excited and they want to touch everything. So we had to try to keep some measure of, of control there. Um, we wanted to retain this particular visual experience. 
um, we didn't want any plaques or other interpretive materials incorporated in order to make sure that the space continued to be appropriate for photo shoots because photo shoots were so essential to our financial picture. Remember, most of our, most of our um, development funding, most of our donations were going into the building of the center. Um, and our, our bread and butter at that point to run the museum was, was photo shoots. And we needed to be able to keep that diversification of revenue. But most importantly, at the same time, what we discovered happening on giving tours was this incredibly intimate thing that happened between our wonderfully passionate docents and our visitors, with a small number of visitors on the tour, um, and the, the tour guide giving a kind of oral history experience. It created um, something very personal. There would be an exchange of stories. Um, the, signs, the signs tell you what they are, and the stories bring that to life. And it, it was it, it seemed incorrect to get in the way of that. Um, so what we did was um, the layout of the collection needed to retain the visual impact of a boneyard while also functioning to support a guided tour. So you see on the left the original neon boneyard, and you see on the right the designed layout. So what we did in, it was in planning the layout of the, of the neon boneyard experience, uh, there is a grand uh, master plan at play to, to support the narrative tour experience. Um, signs are grouped according to either genre or their location in Las Vegas originally, or their place within the history of sign design and or Las Vegas. So we have downtown signs, we have motel signs, we have small local businesses, and we have the Las Vegas Strip. Now, the tour guide needs that in order to provide the narrative for the tour. Uh, however, we didn't want to compromise that wonderful visceral phys visual experience of the original boneyard, which meant, um, you know, in the original boneyard, when signs would come into the collection, signs were placed wherever there was room. Um, you know, you can't really tell a guy with a crane and a three-ton sign, oh, can you just, you know, move it over there? Um, they had to put it where there was room. But when we laid out the collection of the neon boneyard in uh, the museum experience, we could tell the guy with the crane, can you move that big sign just a little more to the left? So it worked out, it worked out beautifully. So here you have a layout of the map of the um, final campus evolution. You can see the, the blue there is the La Concha. The administrative facility is at the back. Um, immediately behind that is the neon boneyard extending out to the left. Um, there is a street down the middle that is McWilliams. That is shut off from, uh, it's no longer a, a through fair. So um, when people enter that street, it's really entering the campus. The green patch is the Neon Boneyard Park. Nancy Diener had mentioned the uh, Southern Nevada Public Land Management Act funding that we received. That built that park. And it, and it allowed for us to, to uh, renovate much of the campus and add the parking lot that is there. So that park is a city park that we manage, that the nonprofit manages. And that pink at the very bottom is the North Gallery. That is very recently, just in recent months, renovated space, uh, a new space that we've added to expand our capabilities for photo shoots, for events, and for educational engagement. Um, the Neon Boneyard as the core collection of the visitor experience. It does incorporate several restored signs, but altogether the museum is this campus as well as nine restored signs uh, on Las Vegas Boulevard and downtown that are installed as public art and is a part of the previously mentioned um, partnership with the City of Las Vegas. Um, and uh, Las Vegas Science Project as a part of the Federal Scenic Byway. So you've got the La Concha Lobby um, as visitor center and museum for the yard as the core visitor experience. I'm going to show you very briefly. So these are restored signs. Um, 
the first sign obviously was the Caballero, the Hacienda Horse and Rider. That's been in place for a long time. But what we envisioned for long term is restored signs placed from immediately in front of the visitor center running the stretch of the Federal Scenic Byway, which begins at Sahara. So eventually there will be kind of a breadcrumb trail of restored signs that runs all the way down the old part of Las Vegas, downtown Las Vegas, that ends at the Neon Museum. Uh, something else that we have tried to do was diversify the ways in which visitors can visit the museum and connect with the mission and the collection, as well as be involved with the overall growth of the project. So because we have a permanent collection, it's kind of challenging for us. Um, and because so much of our revenue um, is about earned, earned income, it's about getting people through the doors. Um, we, we came up with several ways to tackle that. We provide nighttime tours now. So we illuminated the signs. We only have, um, we have a, a fraction of restored signs in the collection, but we um, were able to work with some partners in the community to electrify the sign and signs such that there is uh, uplighting installed in the boneyard. Um, so it, it, it gestures to the a nighttime experience. Um, it's very magical, it's very beautiful, and there's an integrated mix of restored signs and uplit signs with, where the lights change constantly. It's, it's very beautiful. What that's done is that allow, has allowed for us to expand the, the amount of time visitors can spend, the ways in which visitors can visit the project. So it's not just about coming during daylight hours, which has its own challenges in the desert. We now have a nighttime experience that has proven to be our most popular um, tour. Um, we offer, uh, there's obviously the visual of the lobby. Um, all of our retail products are extremely curated. Um, and I don't want to abuse the term curated. I, I want to stress that we put a lot of thought into our retail product so that they um, really reflect our mission, um, the signs, our, the heart of our preservation goals, the aesthetics of mid-century Las Vegas, all of those things that we care about that we know our visitors care about. Um, we have recently in the last year radically expanded our educational engagement opportunities. Um, but then there is also the guided tour experience. So I think what's really important to talk about with the guided tour is that it's not just a random tour. So we have core documents that we use to train uh, our docents, and our wonderful educational team works extremely hard to constantly revise those documents. So we're constantly examining what we talk about. We vet information. Um, we have a, a core doc that everyone has to study, that everyone uses. And we approach the tour uh, content from a kind of a la carte perspective. So there, there's basic information that everyone has to know. And then there's a selection of information that they can pull from to talk about. So that if they're more interested in um, history, they can talk a little bit more about history. If they're a little bit more interested in the architectural aspect of the collection, they can do that as well. Um, because the museum and the collection, uh, as suggested in our challenge in planning for how to run the project, it intersects preservation, it intersects architecture, design, advertising, um, and art. So um, we want to be able to talk about what we believe to be the most important aspect of the science is uh, the preservation of these objects as architecture, um, as art and design, but, but the ways in which signage functions in Las Vegas as architecture in a way that it doesn't really do that anywhere else. Um, and so, uh, docents have an extensive training process that they go through before they begin giving tours. Um, these are some of the other ways people can experience the museum. Um, we have uh, wedding hosts, we have um, events that we host. So in this way, we're able to radically diversify our income. Uh, we currently have 26 staff members, 10 full-time, 16 part-time, and roughly 30 rotating volunteers. So it's actually... Um, you know, I know a lot of other organizations have a lot more volunteers, but our volunteers are 
extremely active, extremely committed. They come every week, some several times a week, and they're very integrated in with, uh, with the staff experience. A brief snapshot of attendance. So um, just to give you an idea of the growth that we've experienced with, with our focus on Fiscal okay. year attendance, fiscal year 13 before we opened, 38,561 visitors. This past year, and keep in mind we opened in October of 2012, so the fiscal year 13 number is only um, nine formal months of being open to the general public. Last year, that number jumped to 70,954 visitors. Now that includes tours, photo shoots, events, and education, and you can see the breakdown there on the pie chart. Um, we still are very tour content, a tour heavy in our visitorship, um, but we're co continually looking for new ways to engage people beyond the tour experience. And that's really for locals and repeat visitors. Um, for this project, social media has been really important for us. Um, and I bring it up because we are a nonprofit with a very lean financial um, <laughs> picture. So although we now actually have a budget for PR and marketing, it is not huge. So it's been a beautiful confluence for us, the growth of social media. This project really beautifully overlaps with um, the viral aspect of social media because the growth and affection for this project and how we grew visitorship um, uh, was really word of mouth based and that viral aspect overlaps really well with the way social media works. It's also a very visual collection. So we really capitalize on that, but we don't want to overly rely on just, you know, um, beautiful pictures of the boneyard. So so our PR marketing team and our social media specialists really focus on how to diversify the kinds of content we um, put out there on social media. So we have our photos, but we also really focus we try to tell stories. We also, uh, for example, we'll have a history posting um, once a week. We have, we have a very specific schedule of posting, of posting times, what our theme is for each day. But we also really encourage interactivity with the community. So a lot of content in our social media is collaborative with our visitor base. That's really, really important for us because so many of our visitors are from all over the world. And in this way, they stay involved, they stay connected, and it's, a, and it's a living, breathing relationship that I think is really important to our success. Um, this provides a visitor profile breakdown. So this is our total visitorship since opening. Um, and I apologize, the percentages aren't in there. Um, but about 19% are from Nevada. Um, uh, about 14% are from California. About 51% is the United States overall, and the rest is international. So um, a huge California visitorship. What's been great for us is that as a tourist town, um, you know, as Nancy always tells, tells me, you're never a profit in your own land. So it's been a challenge to grow um, appreciation for the signs locally. Uh, in Nevada, we've seen, since opening 2012, we've seen just over 3% growth in visitorship, which I'm actually super thrilled with and very proud of, um, to see visitors locally expanding um, and repeat visitors locally. And that's something that we, we need to have continue for the health of the project in the long term. And finally, my final slide um, is revenue breakdown. And again, I'm so sorry it's not showing the breakdown, but I will read you um, a breakdown. 
So that's one one point six one eight million dollars total um, fiscal year fourteen revenue breakdown. So seventy two percent of that is tours. Retail is twelve percent of that. Events is six percent of that. Issues are ten percent of that. Um, so and you can see the numbers on the bottom of the screen. Um, Areas where we thought we'd see stagnation, like photo shoot, has not happened. They continue to grow. So that's been a wonderful surprise for us. Events is a brand new department, and we've exceeded projected incomes there. Um, retail has been wonderful for us, and I think because it's very specialized and highly considered, we believe, in, on a final note, you know, that if we as a staff team love what we are giving to people, what we're putting out there, the kind of experience we're sharing, then our visitors will as well. Um, we ooze the passion and the love for what we're doing, we're doing which is easy to say, um, because hopefully everyone in the field is passionate about what they're doing. Um, but we definitely think of ourselves as the little engine that could, and, um, and it's, it's been a, a wonderful project to be a part of, and it's, uh, we just continue to grow. So thank you. Thank you very much, Danielle. Um, oh, good. I, I was going to ask one of those. Can we go back, Jonathan? Um, I don't know who's controlling this. Um, thanks. The, the total income, is, is your budget about this $2 million annual budget, um, Danielle? Our budget last year, our budget for fiscal year 14 was 1.6. So our net last year was 118748 um, uh, so, I mean, we, we, we did well. You know, a lot of projects when they just opened, and that's for last year. That's not even our first year. That's not fiscal year 13, which is, would have been our first year. We were in the black that year as well, surprisingly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, because most, most of these kinds of projects, the first year they open, even the first three to five years they open, they're operating in the red. Um, so this is really great for us. I think what's important is, you know, something I should have mentioned that I didn't, is, is the number of part-time staff so because we give a, a guided tour experience, that required a lot of staff. And it was a decision that we made as a part of a commitment to a quality experience for the visitor. We didn't want to compromise the, the experience we were already providing visitors that they so loved, that our docents loved giving. But that meant a lot of staff. So I always think of our part-time staff as this little beehive of people buzzing away and buzzing back in, and it's all these moving parts, constant activity. Um, and what that does is, um, you know, it allows for constant. We can constantly add staff there, constantly grow um, there, um, and and it grew so much that we weren't totally prepared for it to continue to grow. We were anticipating. Um, a leveling off because we just weren't sure. There's no example like this. Um, the one thing that I think is important to note is that um, so our budget for this coming year is 1.9 million. We're still very conservative in our projections. Um, you know, we don't want to um, overestimate um, what can happen, and we want to take care of of our of our collection and, and take care of the success that we've had so far. Um, but you know, we recognize that because so much of our income is earned income, the next goals are to grow on that fertile garden with um, more development. Um, we're growing our membership plan constantly, new members every day, um, and larger donors as well. So, so really, um, donations are the next step to the long-term stability of the project. Great. Um, uh, one of the questions, and um, I would encourage everyone to write in questions in the um, Q&A uh, box, because um, we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, uh, one question was, uh, and Danielle, maybe you know this answer, or Nancy, the total project cost um, from the beginning. Um, I, I know that the um, uh, National Scenic Byways grant was about $800,000, which we didn't mention that particular number. Um, Daniel, maybe. Well, the, the, I can give you the number for the entire museum facility was roughly 4.2 million, but 1.9 of that was the Sniplama, the Neon Boneyard Park. So 1.9 of that was the park, but 
funding from, but, but, you know, we couldn't have done this without the park because what happened with the park was the construction of the park happened, but as a part of that, they needed to, you know, dig up for utilities. They needed to put in a parking lot. So that meant they removed all the signs, and they had to basically renovate the lots where the signs were because it was part of the project. And then when they moved the signs back, they just put them back where we asked them to <laughs> rather than where they were before. So that worked out, you know, really well um, in terms of, you know, cutting some financial corners. But 1.9 of the total roughly 4.2 million was uh, for the Neon Bonier Park. I don't have the number right in front of me from the very beginning of moving the La Concha. Great, thank you. Um, uh, somebody has asked, um, and, and I'll ask Nancy to field this question um, about uh, what advice we might have for people who are trying to preserve neon in their communities. Well, I'm. <laughs> it's tough because it depends on the, it's a size thing, it's a scale issue. I mean, the signs are big. And when we first saved the showboat sign, we rushed there at the top of the 30-story building went, oh, we want it, we want it. As the truck <laughs> went into the boneyard, showboat's a big, each letter was probably 15 feet tall. It was huge. So, you know, I, I guess my advice is to save all the neon you can because it's precious. Look for funding. If you can get historic preservation funding, all the better. Uh, but you have to partner with somebody that can take the scale of the signs. I mean, it's just really too hard. You can't put them in somebody's backyard. Um, there, it's a height and width thing. <laughs> Um, and an another question, um, uh, probably Danielle could could take this, um, is about um, uh, how the museum acquires signs now. Um, Nancy mentioned Yesco. Maybe um, we could say a little bit more about uh, Yesco. I seem to have lost Danielle's uh, video. Um, uh, and if she's still here, she could. Okay. Um, uh, you know, maybe a few words, Nancy, that? about, yes, we can hear you. Um, Nancy, a few words about Yesco and the relationship there and how that collection came to be. Um, and where new signs, uh, uh, Danielle, if you could, where the new signs are coming from and how they're seeking you out now. So maybe um, Nancy to start. Yeah, well, Yesco, of course, this project wouldn't have happened really without Yesco. I mean, there are key things in this project I could probably write a book about. Yesco was one of them. And obviously, they had been collecting, they were the biggest sign designers and makers in this town for many years. And they had been saving all these signs as hotels went up and down and projects open and closed. They'd bring them to their, what they called their boneyard, which is way out on the other side of town. And eventually, they even knew they had too many. In the, and so they approached this nascent organization trying to get neon saved in the city and they said hey, look would you be interested in ours if you Danielle, maybe you know uh, well, um, the skull, the Treasure Island skull sign might be one to to mention of, of how recent signs have come well, into um, the collection. You know, I will say that um, no two. I would say that no two signs uh, come into the collection in quite the same way. So, um, you know, it's a it's a. Uh, it's a confluence of events, every sign that comes into the collection. Some, some signs that come in are the result of a long-term process of, of years, I mean several years of conversations with a corporate owner um, if I knew that a sign is in danger. Um, something like the Treasure Island Skull, I believe that was in Yesco's collection. But something like, um, you know, like the Sahara or uh, you know, the Tropicana, these, these large casino resorts, um, that can take years of conversation um, for a sign to come into our collection. Uh, a donor uh, covers all costs of bringing the sign to the collection. Now, but they can um, write off those costs to the extent that, you know, tax, uh, the taxes allow them to do that. Um, 
but you know, I'll, I'll have situations where I'll get a call at four in the morning um, from a sign tech that I know who's working on a project where he's taking down a sign that we had no idea. It was a very secret process. And he'll just call me and he'll say, we're taking down a sign. Do you want it? Um, or we'll get a call from an inspector for a property who inspected um, for rodent control before they were going to demo something. Um, so we have friends all over that um, in, in construction and in um, you know, public works uh, you know, area um, that that you know that call us, but then you know we get calls from the community, um, you know, uh, people, the concerned citizens who will see a, a you know a construction team on a on the side of a property that they love, um, you know, it's it's no two acquisitions are the same, and and each one involves many many people, and I think what's really important to just address very very briefly the, the question that an individual had um, about what they could do in their community. Um, just to reiterate what Nancy said, it really requires a, a, a lot of people working together. But I can't stress enough that restoring a sign is extremely expensive. But also, finding a place to put that sign is very difficult. <laughs> and that takes a lot of people working together to make happen. Um, great. Can and Danielle, let me ask Let me ask one more question. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, viewers is uh, asking if you have any docents who dress up as Elvis or Liberace um, for their tour. <laughs> All right, well, uh, we're planting seeds. My staff is watching this, so they're going to ask me if they can now. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, no, we do we do have things like that for special occasions. Um, we might have to start a new ha Halloween tradition with this recommendation. Um, but <laughs> we we host weddings and <laughs> we host weddings and things like that in the museum. And sometimes Elvis will be inefficient. Um, sometimes uh, Johnny Cash will be inefficient. Um, you know, we have uh, special events at the museum as well where where we dress up. Um, we have all kinds of scenarios, but uh, but I think now we're going to have to start a new Halloween tradition. Great. Um, well, uh, I want to thank everyone for participating today, our um, uh, our presenters and uh, the audience. Um, I, I think what we've demonstrated is that this is a very creative project. It's very much um, alive and well in Las Vegas. It, it gets great visitorship. Um, of both residents and tourists that that uh, come to Las Vegas, um, we encourage everyone when you're when you're in that neck of woods to visit. Um, and thank you all for participating, Jonathan. I know you have some closing uh, words. Thank you. Uh, yes, and thank you every all of our speakers for uh, presenting such a wonderful presentation. Um, I think what we're going to do now is close by uh, doing a quick evaluation, and I wanted to. Um, encourage you to uh, continue to support CPF and also support projects like this. Um, the next event uh, that is occurring uh, for the California Preservation Foundation is uh, a two-part series on uh, preservation technology uh, next Tuesday, beginning next Tuesday, September 16th, and then the part two will be on Tuesday, September 30th. The first part will be on concrete and plaster, the second will be on energy efficiency, and if you'd like to learn more about these events, you can visit news.californiapreservation.org slash events. Um, thanks again to our speakers. Uh, at this point, I'm going to close by uh, doing a quick evaluation. And I wanted to um, encourage you to uh, continue to support CPF and also support projects like this. Um, the next event. Uh, that is occurring uh, for the California Preservation Foundation is a two-part uh, a two-part series on uh, preservation technology uh, next Tuesday, beginning next Tuesday, September 16th, and then the part two will be on Tuesday, September 30th. The first part will be on concrete and plaster. The second will be on energy efficiency. And if you'd like to learn more about these events, you can visit news.californiapreservation.org/events. Um, Thanks again to our speakers. Uh, at this point, I'm going to throw up a quick quiz. And um, 
bear with me for a second here because I thought it was already up, but I'll throw it up right now. Um, and it's a multiple choice response, and uh, it helps us gauge uh, what you would like to see in our programs and how you enjoyed this program.